spawning grounds of U-boat warfare. From these wrecked submarine pens came the underwater prowlers that sank millions of tons of Allied shipping. Prefabricated submarines at this Bremen shipyard might have put Germany on a mass production basis if the war had continued for a short time longer. But the scourge has ended. The U-858 approaches Cape May, New Jersey, after having surrendered at sea to two destroyer escorts. The 240-foot underseas craft is manned by an American prize crew, keeping a watchful eye on the Nazi skeleton crew, which remained to operate the ship. The prisoners, who sank 18 Allied vessels, come ashore to await confinement at Fort Miles. Barely a day later, a second submarine arrives at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, after having surrendered formally off the main coast. The submarine's officers await transfer to shore. This U-boat is credited with a speed of 20 knots and a cruising range of 10,000 miles. The prisoners are taken to Portsmouth Naval Prison, where they will be kept for an indefinite period. The U-boat peril is dead, but this arrogant captain personifies an unrepentant Nazism. Berlin's army school is the end of the road for the Nazi reign of terror. Here, Air Marshal Tedder, General Eisenhower's deputy, and Russia's Marshal Zhukov meet with Field Marshal Keitel, the haughty Prussian aristocrat and representative of the general staff. This time, it's the German army that surrenders. No civilians are involved as in World War I. This time, the Wehrmacht takes its full share of blame for years of ruin and brutality. <laughs> Keitel signs, marking the end of all German military action. Tedder and Zhukov add their signatures to the document that surrenders Germany to Allied control and completes Nazi humiliation. <laughs> Following the ratification, the Allied officers tour the gutted Nazi capital. Berlin's once proud architecture is only a memory. Years of heavy pounding by the RAF and American air forces have made Germany's first city almost unlivable. Thousands of tons of bombs have pockmarked the famous Brandenburg Gate and laid waste the Hotel Adlon, former meeting place of world travelers. All Nazi government buildings have been destroyed, burying the infamous Hitler and Goebbels in their rubble. Berlin's history, as one of the world's great capitals, is ended. Not only her capital, but most of Germany's mighty industrial cities are wiped out. These first pictures of Hamburg, made by the RAF, reveal the indescribable destruction wrought by repeated air attacks on the Reich's second city. Once the largest seaport on the continent of Europe, Hamburg's docks along the River Elba served the shipping of the world. Now, Hamburg is a ghost city, only the outer walls of its thousands of buildings standing in mute testimony to the overwhelming power of a light bombing. Bombing that tore the heart out of the Reich and buried tyranny in its ashes. At Merkers, Germany, this salt mine holds one of the strangest secrets of the war. A secret that was to deal Germany a crushing financial blow during the last days of the conflict. Here, GIs uncovered a fabulous hoard of jewelry, silver, currency, bullion, and art treasures. Much of it, the accumulated loot of five years of war. Practically every museum in Europe is represented in these masterpieces, which include Raphael's, Rembrandt's, Van Dyck's, and many other great masters' works, buried now 1,200 feet below the ground in what the Nazis considered a safe hiding place and a bomb-proof shelter. The 100 tons of gold bullion represents most of Germany's reserve. Signal Corps pictures show the enormous cache of currency from all the European countries in Reichsbank containers. Two million dollars in American money also were found. Allied officials will take charge of the treasure until its disposition has been decided. Murder will out, even from the depths of the earth. High in the Alps, just a few miles from the Brenner Pass, a picturesque villa is the meeting place of Allied authorities and German political and war prisoners. 
Among them are the wife and daughter of former Chancellor Schuschnigg of Austria. He was married during captivity. And one of Hitler's former financial backers, industrialist Fritz Tyson, with his wife. Many royal prisoners were brought here from the Dachau prison camp, as was General Halder, formerly of the German general staff, and Pastor Niemöller, the anti-Nazi Hitler dared not kill. Also among the liberated was a group of allied flyers and the nephew of the King of England, Lord Lascelles, captured in Italy. Another of the freed was Lieutenant John Wynant, son of our ambassador to England. Farther north at Magdeburg, we meet a German of a different stripe, General Dietmars, Nazi military radio commentator and previous military governor of Magdeburg, surrenders to the Yanks. Dietmar's voice had failed long ago, and he used a double, like many another fallen Nazi blowhard. Our superfort raids on Japan are swiftly being intensified as more and more of the B-29s roll from the assembly lines. This strike at Nagasaki blasts at airplane factories. From Saipan, others blast at Tokyo, and Iwo Jima-based fighters escort the heavy planes with an Army Air Force camera along. Flak is heavy, but Jap pilots were caught by surprise to find a fighter escort, and scores of enemy planes were picked off by the Mustangs from Iwo Jima. Heavy fires are burning as we start for home, dodging a blanket of flak. Those of the forts badly hit head for the strip at Iwo Jima instead of their home on Saipan. Thus, by using this new base, 50 landed safely that otherwise might have been lost. Pierced by numerous shell holes, their sturdy construction and skillful piloting brought them back safely. Japan will meet the fate of ruined Germany as we throw more and more power against her.